Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming this evening to um, hear what Stephen and Heidi have um, got to um, provide us with in regard to their, um, their uh, uh, trip to uh, Kenya and the, and the work that they will be uh, doing there. We are greatly uh, thankful that um, they're willing to, to do this for us. Um, so I will first just to start off like to read a, a passage from Romans and then I'll lead you in prayer and then um, maybe we can invite Stephen Hardy up. So I'll just read from uh, Romans 10, 1 to 13. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So far. And that is, yeah, thinking of uh, Stephen Heidi's work that they will be doing. Obviously, um, helping the missionaries out there. And... Um, missionaries obviously preaching the word and, and that everyone there may just, you know, believe and that uh, they will be saved. So we'll also pray for a blessing on this evening and on their things. So I shall just lead you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you to ask a blessing on this meeting tonight. We pray that you may give Heidi and Steve the strength to share the plans that they have made and the preparations that they still have to make. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with them in their preparations in the next uh, couple of months, Father. We pray that all go well and, uh, Lord, that you may uh, strengthen them and uh, give them the peace that they need to be able to do these preparations. We also pray, Lord, for the organisation, the African Inland Missionaries and their work that they do among the nations. We pray that many hearts will be transformed through the gospel that will be spread amongst those in those nations. And Lord, we pray that you may grant us all a blessed evening. We pray this, Father, in your Son's name. Amen. So I'd like to invite Stephen Hardy up to do the presentation. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, coming along and being willing to hear a little bit about our journey to Kenya and what we, we will be doing there. First of all, um, Habari, Mimi ni Steve, Nina Faraha, Kukutana na Wewe. That's as much Swahili you'll get out of me. It says, hello, my name's Steve, pleased to meet you. Mimi ni Heidi, Mangu Awa Bariki, which translates to my name is Heidi and God bless you. And that's about the extent from me tonight as well. We did do a challenge with the, uh, the younger youth on Friday night where there were some Swahili words they had to put together and some of them actually did a very good job, embarrassingly to say, probably better than us. I think the winner was uh, Dan Coote though. He did manage to say, I want a chicken, I want to buy a chicken burger. So, who are we? You, you pretty much know Heidi, because she's been around the Free Reform Church for a long time. Um, I have a slightly circuitous background or a way to come to the church. I grew up in the Salvation Army, which is a, quite a different church. Um, 
Everybody wears the same kind of, well, when I was there, everyone wore the same kind of suit. There was brass bands, there was choirs, um, but it still had a heart for mission. And I guess that was something that was instilled in, in me as, a, as a, a young kid, was that there are missionaries who go and do work elsewhere. Um, during the day, I teach at Scotch Oakburn. I trained as a music teacher. School found out I had an IT background, so I started teaching IT. Um, I'm head of department these days, so I run a team of about eight teachers and 20 or so music tutors. So that kind of keeps me busy during the day. We're both involved with music outside of school um, at the university. Um, and of course, Heidi's with the SES, does a lot of community-minded work with that as well. So that's kind of who we are. But I guess, really, you're interested more in knowing about Africa Inland, inland Mission, who they are, what they do, Rift Valley Academy, where we are going to serve, and what we will be doing when we get there um, in about 67 days. So we are working under the organisation or under the umbrella of the organisation Africa Inland Mission. And uh, if you've never heard of them before you sort of came across the work we're doing, then you're not alone because I'd never heard of them either and nor had Steve. And uh, when we started on this journey, we actually asked Pastor Wes and we said, you know, this is the organisation we're thinking of working with. Do you know anything about them? And interestingly, he came back and said, well, actually, yes. When I was a child growing up at school, in primary school, um, we collected money for this organisation. So that was really wonderful to hear. He was the first person we knew who had heard of Africa Inland Mission. And so we sort of had a look at who they were because obviously if we were going to go down the path of working for Africa Inland Mission, we wanted to make sure it was an organisation that we felt that we could, um, with our Christian faith, um, and doing good faith. So Africa Inland Mission was started um, in 1895 and it was started by a person called Peter Cameron Scott and he was from the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. And he went across to Africa and basically got the ball rolling as far as who Africa Inland Mission is. And so it evolved and over the years, beginning in Kenya, which is where they were first based, um, it grew to being able to reach African um, um, people all across the country. And today it has become the largest interdenominational mission operating in Africa, so it's huge. There are a thousand missionaries who are out in the field for Africa Inland Mission and they, um, they are working in 22 different countries in Africa. So they also work across five regions, and I think perhaps, can you just flick to the next slide so we can see? Oh no, there's another one across, yeah. Just have a quick look there. So this is where Africa Inland Mission is working, and they actually work across um, five, five regions, which you will see there, and the top part there um, with, the, with the yellow stripe is our creative access area. So this is the area where they won't actually name the countries and where they won't actually specify exactly where they're working for security reasons. But these are the areas that Africa Inland Mission works in. And when we had a look at what Africa Inland Mission does and we had a, a chat to Pastor Wes, we decided that this was an organisation that we felt we could work for and so we continued with our journey um, towards um, where we are today. And Steve will tell you a bit more. So before we get on to where we're up, uh, up to, Africa Inland Mission has three, three strands. One is the actual boots on the ground, the missionaries working out in the mission field, working with tribes like the Maasai um, and other, um, what they call unreached people groups. There are about a thousand unreached people groups that have never met a Christian, heard the name of Jesus, or even seen a church. And that's about 300 million people. Double check that number again the other night just to make sure I wasn't telling lies, but 300 million people haven't heard. So that's the Making Disciples branch or arm of Africa and the mission. The next is equipping and mobilising. Now we'll talk a little bit about our orientation up in Gosford. We do another three week orientation in Nairobi once we arrive in Africa, and that is the mobilising part where they actually get the people and they work with them, they equip them to have the necessary skills um, and cultural knowledge to, to be where they are going. Um, there are mobilising regions for each country, so the Asia Pacific is the, the branch we come out of and that's based up in Gosford. There's an American one, there's South America and there's Europe. Um, Hong Kong have just opened up their own, New Zealand want to open up their own as well. So there are mobilising regions. So that's the equipping and mobilising. 
and their support workers, and we're going as support. They still call us missionaries, but we're going as support missionaries, supporting those in the field. We're supporting by educating and caring for their children. There's another one called um, AIM Air. So they have pilots and airplane technicians who work for them, who fly the missionaries into the remote areas and get them out. So they're the three parts of AIM. Rift Valley Academy is the school. Rift Valley Academy has been around since 1906. Yeah. So RVA has been around since 1906. Um, it was established because there was seen the need for the children of the missionaries to receive a good education. It was set up by an American guy, so it's an American school, American curriculum, kind of American school terms as well. Um, and it got a pretty decent name not long after it was founded because President Teddy Roosevelt flew across to Kenya, or sailed across, and he opened the school. He laid the cornerstone. So that's how in such high regard it, it was held. Um, interesting fact, it, in 2003, was rated the second top school, a high school in all of Africa. That's 20 years ago, but hey, uh, I couldn't find any more uh, relevant or new data on it. Currently, there are about 500 students at the school, um, over 30 nationalities of students who work there. There are um, also students who come from the local village of Kajabi and there are now more and more African born um, students there because one of AIMS, AIMS is to have the, the African Christians trained up to be missionaries in their own country. So they now send their own students back to the school. Um, so just, just to um, be able to give you a, um, a definition of what Africa Inland Mission is about, they are a Christian mission sending agency and they have a heart for Africa's people. That's the long and uh, short of what they're about. AIM's desire is to see the worship of Jesus Christ spread across the continent of Africa through individual lives, fully committed to him, and then also collectively through Christ-centred church communities. And they work in line with the Africa Inland Church. So those two go hand in hand, and they're the churches that are, um, that are formed around the country. His church in Africa is growing vast and it's growing daily. But there's still over 1,000 African people groups who have yet to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And I guess for us, when we heard this figure as we did our training in Gosford over summer, this really struck a chord with us. When you think of so many people who've never had the opportunity to hear the gospel, um, have never even met a Christian, um, and they're the people groups, let alone the 300 million individuals that form those 1,000 people groups, um, it just shows what a great need there is for the gospel to go out in Africa. Click, Larry. So they're the regions that we spoke about, the central region, the eastern region, which is where we will be working, which is the red region there, uh, the southern region and the northern region. And then there's also the diaspora, which is um, where they're working um, in different places around the world, including places in Scotland, Europe, and also in America, where they actually do some work in communities that are spread out in those places as well. Okay, so why us? Why are we going to um, Kenya? That's a very good question and I'll let Steve talk a little bit about how we got to where we are today because it's been an incredible journey and um, the biggest thing that we've seen in all of it is God's amazing hand and amazing leading. But let's just give a quick summary of that. It's hard. Keep it quick. A quick <laughs> summary, right. So, um, about 20 years ago, I was invited to do some work in America at a university called Northwestern College and the head of the musical music faculty there was a guy called Rod Leffler, um, one of our good friends, Monty Mumford, who's taught out at UTAS for, for 20 years. He was doing a five-year contract job teaching music over in um, Minnesota. So Monty said, hey, come over, spend some time, do some teaching for me, um, come and check it out. So I went over and I met Rod and I met him a couple of times because he was like the head of the school, so we don't talk to him very often because he's too busy and too important. Um, and um, that was it. He, oh, he came out here in 2007 with the, the band from the university over there and that was the last time I spoke or saw him. And then a curious email arrived in my inbox in March last year. That basically said, hey Steve, 
you remember me? I said, yes, of course. Um, and he said, I've been talking to Monty. Monty said, no, are you interested in going to Kenya to teach at an international school? I thought, great. Why not? Well, I've been looking for something different. I've been at school for about 20 years. Up for a challenge, up for a change. In my world, Scotch Oakburn, an international school means you're going to teach somewhere where they probably pay twice your salary. I thought, you beauty, gonna go, do it for two years or so, retirement, here I come. And so that was the email. So I followed that up, chased it up, did a bit of research, contacted Africa Inland Mission, sent the, the, the inquiry off to their stock standard form on the web page. 10 minutes later, my office phone rings. It was Liz, the personnel manager from Africa Inland Mission in uh, Gosford. We had a good long chat. She sent us the applications, the paperwork, and then we took it home and read it. Thought, wow, this is a, a big process. And then read the bit that says you go as volunteers. I went, right, thanks, but no thanks. Um, then, a week or so later, Wes did a sermon. And the sermon was on, um, I can't remember, but it was around using your time and your talents in the service of God. And what were you basically willing to give up? And I went, right. I wonder who he's talking to. Um, and so we talked about it. And we thought, well, let's take it a bit further. So we filled in the, the basic application, which was like name, address, phone number, CV, contacts, church, all this other kind of stuff. And then we had to meet with the consistory because we needed our church's blessing to go. They, the Africa Inland Mission won't send anybody out without their church's blessing and full support. So we met with the consistory and it was like going into the principal's office. Um, <laughs> it was a bit daunting, so we put together as we, we like to do. We were quite prepared, had a couple of pages worth of information we sent out. So they were informed, we were informed, we knew what we were talking about. And we were on the agenda for about 15 minutes and about 45 minutes later we walked out and uh, breathed a sigh of relief because Wes went, right gentlemen, what do you reckon? Oh, it's a yes from me. It's a bit like being an Australian Idol, all those kind of sing-songs things. <laughs> it's a yes from me. It's like, yes from me. And it's a yes from me. And it was unanimous. And we were just gobsmacked that in such a short time, there we were. We had the church's blessing. So we sat down and filled in the applications and about 14,000 words later, because it wasn't just name and address, do you want the job? Yes, it was a whole bunch of um, faith statements and a whole bunch of other information we had to provide. So we did that. Um, then we had a video conference with the crew at the school in Kenya, and they said, can you start in July? This was July last year. And we said, uh, no. Um, because it was about that time we also found out that we needed to raise support. And so once again, we nearly pulled the pin on the project because we thought there's no way possible. So we had a meeting, then we had um, a, a meeting with the AIM people online as well, and then we had to do an interview, which was a two, two and a half hour video conference with the national director, the personal manager, um, and Wes. And they asked us a whole bunch of questions two and a half hours later. It was doctrinal stuff, theological stuff. Why do we want to do it? Um, what do our families think? Do you reckon you could go for two years? Do you reckon you could go for longer? The guy I'm replacing as the director of bands that had been there 29 years. I will not be there that long. I'll be about too old. Um, and then, so all, all, everything just flowed. Everything just kept flowing. And then we had to organise an orientation. I said, oh, can you come up here? I said, no, we're still in the school term. How about here? No, we're teachers. We work at schools. We just can't take random holidays. So we said, how about these dates in January? And they said, sure. So we did that up in um, Gosford. And up there you'll see some of the people who were, who were there. The guy at the back left-hand corner, that's Len, the national director. The people in front of him are other people who are looking at going and serving. Um, the, the lady in the blue dress has been working in Kenya for, on Tanzania, for, for, with her husband who's behind her for many years, running a farm. Because they're running the farm as their way of connecting with their community and 
teaching and working with the, the local people and spreading the word of, of Christ and the gospel, but without you know, running a church per se. So they're actually doing it slightly creatively. Um, of course, there's Heidi, there's me, and to the, the right of us, there are some people who are going to serve also, and the lady on the end and the red top is Liz, the personnel manager that we've had a lot of contact with. And underneath it, they made us um, eat some African food. You're it's actually wondering what that is. So it's like a boiled egg with some, some meat mash stuff on what's well, normally some kind of flat bread. Um, and you, we had to eat it with just our right hand because the left hand is used for hygiene purposes. So just one other thing to add to that, which was really interesting, is that um, when this first email came through, we were evaluating life and wondering what we were going to do. And we actually had some more long service leave coming up. And how many years ago now have we been on our trip? Eight years ago, we were travelling the country. Eight years ago, we'd done a motorbike trip around the country and really enjoyed getting out and just being able to um, step back and reflect on where God might be leading our lives. And we just thought, we don't know where we're going, let's do another one of those trips in our long service leave and see where God might be calling us to be. And so we were just in the middle of planning all of this, working out when we're gonna go, how we're gonna save our funds and what we were gonna do when this email came across our desk. And it was really quite life um, shattering for us and um, life changing for us in the best possible way. Because all of a sudden, instead of following what was essentially, you know, could have been a selfish pursuit in that we were going to go and enjoy ourselves for our long service leave, we suddenly turned it on its head and went, actually, God's calling us to something much bigger than ourselves. And that was really exciting and terrifying all at the same time, as we thought, this is going to cost in many ways. And yet we could feel God opening the doors and calling us over and over again, no, this is where I'm leading you to go. No, you've got more to do than just to go and enjoy yourselves on your long service leave. And so it sort of really has shifted our focus and we've gone from wanting to do a motorbike trip around the country to selling our motorbikes and all the gear that we have and all our vehicles <laughs> um, to being able to come and do this. And yet we couldn't feel more joy at what God is calling us to do. And it's just been a wonderful journey to this point. So it's just worth, worth for us also reflecting on where we've come from and the amazing way God answers prayer. And it's one of the things that I've always believed, be careful what you pray for, <laughs> because God might answer those prayers in ways that you don't expect. And we'd pray that God would show us where he wanted us to work and to live and how he wanted to use us. Was it here in our schools? Was it doing something different? And uh, we believe God's shown us that in a way that's been quite turned life on its head. So that's wonderful. So why us? Next one, Larry. Okay, so where are we going and when are we going? Well, Steve's made this lovely little graphic there to give you a bit of an idea as to where we're going. Is that working? It should be working. Yep, there it goes. That's where we're going. So on the 4th of July, which is in how many days? He counts down every day, I think. Um, in 60-something days, we'll be heading across to Perth, Western Australia, where we get to um, see uh, my family for a few days. And then from there, we head across to Nairobi, and in Nairobi, we'll spend three weeks doing our, our induction over there. There we go. And then from Nairobi, we head 50 k's northwest-ish. And that's where the little township is um, where we'll be working. And that is Kajabi. And then within Kajabi is, um, is the Rift Valley Academy where we'll be working. And Rift Valley Academy is not necessarily what people think of, or the Rift Valley when they think of Africa. Often when people think of Africa, a bit like Australia, they think it's all the same Australia-wide, but it's not. Um, where we're going to be is, is at an altitude similar to what Ben Lomond is. So that's a little bit different than sort of in the lowlands where Nairobi is, where it's very humid and still quite hot there. Where we'll be is much cooler climbs, and I'm very happy about that. I'm a cool climb person, so I'm quite happy that we're not going to be quite in the stinking tropical heat, but it'll be quite a high altitude. And we'll show you some photos shortly. You'll see the Rift Valley, which it sits perched above the Rift Valley. Where we're going to be in the Rift Valley Academy is a compound of sorts, so it's a big gated community where the school is. Um, one of the first questions my dad asked is, is it safe there? And that's something your dad's allowed to ask, I think. <laughs> and uh, we said, well, you know, safety is something that can be measured in lots of different ways, but basically where we are is considered to be one of the safer places um, in Kenya. 
and um, you know the ratings for safety do get reviewed regularly and we are kept in good communication but where we are is considered to be quite a safe place and the township itself is very mission oriented there's a mission hospital there there's an Africa inland church there so the actual township itself is um, is a real mission oriented township it's also a dry town and that's something that we might you know sort of think of when we think of outback Australia some of the towns in outback Australia are dry towns but also um, where we're going to be. No alcohol and no cigarettes. So Steve's got to give up smoking. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, but they have found that um, having it as a dry town, they don't want to change that because they found the crime rates very low there and it's been really good for their population. So that's, that's um, something just as an interesting uh, reflection of the, the mission community that is in that area. What's up next? That little box, black box there, is a video about Rift Valley Academy. It's about seven or eight years old now, but it will give you a good insight into the school and what it is there for and what the teachers do and what it means to those missionaries who work out in the field um, doing the hard yards, doing the hard work. Um, I hope it gets a bit frustrated when I say this, but the some of the missionaries out there who are working in the field literally live in cow poo and straw huts, no running water, no bathroom, no electricity. Um, and they send their kids to be parented, cared for, educated and discipled um, so that, because they can't do it. They don't have the internet, they can't have computers, they can't do science labs, it's not safe. So they send their kids to this school. And you'll hear some of the stories of some of the missionaries who work out in the field. Thanks, Larry. I'm a student at Rift Valley Academy. My parents are missionaries in Africa. I am a student at Rift Valley Academy. I am a student at Rift Valley Academy. Rift Valley Academy is a boarding school located in the Great Rift Valley of Africa. I'm a church planter among the Kuria people. I'm sure there's less than 1% evangelical uh, Christians among the Kuria. They've been overlooked. We have two kids at RVA, soon to have three. As a family, we work amongst the Maasai people. Timothy has a strong missionary attitude. And since he came to RVA, we feel that he has actually grown in his faith. And we can see that when he comes home because he wants to be out there working with the Maasai and sharing his faith. I feel that RVA staff are doing an exceptional job at developing our kids spiritually. They not just are caring for our kids, but they love our kids. And they go the extra mile to see them mature and grow even spiritually. I think the most important part of my job is making sure that I love these kids. RVA is a community designed for growth. Everything leads to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. I have strong relationships. I have a dynamic worldview. I have seen the world. I am responsible. I am loved. And I really feel that God is, is using RVA to whom much is given, much is required. And I feel like God has given me so much here at RVA in these next couple of years and the rest of my life, God is going to ask so much of me. So I feel like, I mean, this is, this is, this is where it's at. This is probably one of the best places a teenager can live. A fully accredited American school RVA has set a high standard of academic excellence. I'll never forget opening the envelope that the first kid in 100 years had been accepted to Harvard. And from that point, we've had 25 or 30 kids be accepted at those schools. But what it's done more than anything is break out the ceiling and have kids know they can go any place God's called them to be. Within an African context, Rift Valley Academy seeks to disciple, nurture, and educate students towards Christian maturity for the glory of God. The 
We are truly humbled by the caliber of staff who give up otherwise very lucrative, comfortable jobs to come out here and teach our kids and love our kids and help raise our kids. We couldn't do our job unless they were here. We decided to send Laura to RVA. We knew that for her to be able to succeed well as she continued on after high school and to college and further in life, we wanted her to be able to be involved in things like sports and music in academics where she was being challenged not only by a teacher, a trained teacher, but also by her fellow students. RVA is teaching them a lot about what it means to be a leader and how to do that amongst your peers. Because our kids are here at RVA, they have great opportunity for things that they couldn't do at home. The internet and computer, the opportunities they have here. Science labs, my kids love science and biology. We're so grateful for RVA because we can offer them more. I will leave here a stronger person. I will change the world. I will love. I will impact my culture. I will seek the lost. I will love. I will never stop growing. I will lead. I will follow Christ. I will love. The staff have been a really big part of my life. They are just more than teachers. They really get involved in our lives spiritually and emotionally. They inspire me to want to grow in Christ. They've just helped me and nurtured me in my uh, spiritual faith and shown me who God really is. And it's been a blessing just because um, I've just been surrounded by people who truly love God and it's just helped me to become the person that I am today. At a school like RVA, with such a broad scope of activity and opportunity, it takes an army of behind the scenes support staff to keep it running smoothly. This is the place where we pray that each student will grow in Christ and will develop a biblical worldview. We want to equip them academically and socially to glorify God in their future lives. thankful for RVA. What they say to us over and over again is we're here for you. We're, we're not called to your ministry. We don't know how you do it, but we're here so that you can do it. They minister to us by loving our kids. We love the RVA staff and not just because we know them, but because our kids love them. I'm a missionary in Africa. I am a missionary in we Africa. Are missionaries in Africa. I'm a missionary in Africa, and we couldn't do our ministry if it wasn't for Rift Valley Academy. And I couldn't be here if it wasn't for Rift we Valley Academy. We couldn't do our ministry. We couldn't be here if it wasn't. I don't know how we would survive out here. I couldn't be here if it wasn't for Rift Valley Academy. I mentioned his American curriculum. Um, that was very American. Um, I think statistics these days that it was 30 or 40 percent of the students at the, the, the academy are from South Korea. Um, they are sending a lot of people out into the mission field, the, the South Koreans. Um, there was a picture of the library. You would have seen um, some flags that represents every nation that has a student there currently. And each Friday, Friday, I understand, they have a a flag raising ceremony, ceremony as part of their chapel where the flag of Kenya is raised, but they also have out the front flags of, of the nations of the, the people who are there. We followed a, a guy, Ashley, who's just returned from um, RVA back to New Zealand. Um, he did his best to uh, change the culture of the Americans a little bit to uh, put a bit of a, a New Zealand spin on it. 
Yeah, we're going to teach them how to play cricket. Um, <laughs> you can go to the, ne the next slide, thanks, Larry. So this is a picture of the Rift Valley. So this is looking down into the, the town, sort of surrounding townships, a town of Kajabi, which is about a thousand, about two thousand people in that that village. Um, one of the main draw cards for going to Kajabi is um, it is one of the prime Kuaha areas in uh, Kenya. Kuaha is Kenyan for coffee. Um, next one, thanks, Larry. The, the guy there, that's Rod. That's he worked there for a term, one school term, filling in f while Steve Taylor, who was the previous band director, the guy that I'm going to replace, um, went back to America on what's called home assignment. We'll talk a little bit about that later. That's Rod's wife, Eloise. She's a doctor, and she worked at the school as their school doctor. They have carpenters, they have builders, they have um, mums and dads who go and look after the dorms. It's not just teachers, there are lots of people who go there working in different, um, different ways. And you can see some of the flags also. Thanks, Larry. Um, that's one of the, the uh, high school buildings. Thanks, Larry. Click. Titchy Swat, that's the primary school. So they have kids from kindergarten through to year, year 12. It's a boarding school, and the kindergarten kids board too. That's why they need people like, well, maybe like Heidi, um, to go look after them and care for them. I'll be the one giving the kids the hard time. Um, thanks, Larry. That is uh, some of the staff accommodation. We get accommodation on campus. It's empty. We have to furnish it. We have to rent it. But they, they look at you and say, two people, you get a two-bedroom house. Um, Steve Taylor, the previous band director, had four kids. They got a four or five bedroom place. They refresh them every, every time um, someone moves out. Thanks, Larry. That's just another view. Um, that's one of, the, one of the great roads. Heidi said it's about 50k, 55k's from the capital city. It's about a two hour drive. They're called Kenyan roads. Everybody who works there, as in you know, teachers, um, have to have an inside worker and an outside worker. Somebody from the local community so that we're investing back into that community. We're not just there taking their land, taking their space, doing those kind of things, but we're actually helping grow the economy there. So we, we effectively hire, employ an indoor person and an outdoor person. That's just another shot of one of the school buildings, um, all built by volunteers. They come in, they build, um, and they extend the school as and when necessary. Thanks, Larry. It's just another view of the, kind of the, the area. I think the building on the left is the front to maybe the chapel. I guess we'll find out in about 60, about 80 days when we get there. Um, thanks, Larry. This is the main drive into the school. And uh, off to the left could be the main road into the hospital. The hospital is right at the very end of the school's road. Thanks, Larry. That's the, uh, it's a bit small to see, but it says Super Dhaka. Dhaka is um, Swahili for supermarket. So that is the main store in the town. Whatever you can't get there, you can't get. So um, sometimes people take trips into Nairobi to, to replenish things, but um, that, that is the store. That dusty road is the main road through the township. Um, that is the Africa Inland Church. The school has church services, chapel services on campus, but they do go down and worship at that church with, with the local community as well. And that was probably established around 1900, same time the school was. That's the uh, principal sat out looking out of his office. It's a, a monkey on one of the roofs at the school. Thanks, Larry. There are baboons that roam through the campus every day. And, and just an add-in here, Steve's going to have nightmares about this. He doesn't deal with creatures at all, possums or mice or anything like that. So the thought of having monkeys that run up to your front door is something that's waking him up at night. <laughs> you know, having taught kids for a while, I'm kind of used to things running around all the time. Um, right, um, that's the library. You can see there the flags of the nationalities of students and staff that are at RVA when that photo was taken. 
It's quite a well-resourced school when you, you look at it and think about it being in Kenya, but not as well-resourced as some of our Western schools would be. Thanks, Larry. As well as being teachers, music teachers there, part of what we do is we go out into the community. So this is Rod, the band director I'll be replacing, or who, who was there a little while ago, with some of the band kids somewhere in Kenya, just going out and meeting with village kids. Thanks, Larry. That's one of the huts that they, of the people that the, the village they went to visit. And there's a student just interacting with one of the, the village kids. Blonde. Yep, fascinated by blonde hair, yes. And it's just a, another of inquisitive kids with the, um, the RVA kids behind them. Thanks, Larry. And that's one of the sunsets out of the school, looking across to what's called Mount Longknot. That's the mountain in the background. Um, that's the night time view. It's not too shabby, is it? So, thanks, Harry. So, what are we doing? We're going, as I said earlier, in mission support, where we teach, um, teach music. Possibly they may they need a computer teacher. They may get me to do some of that. They may need a bit of work in the, the titchy swap for classroom work or art with Heidi and music with Heidi. They need people working from K to ten or to K to twelve with music. We'll be there as teachers. We'll be there to disciple the students. Um, we'll help you hosting Bible studies in our home. The kids will apparently just go, they're struggling, bang, 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 on your door. If you're a teacher, they, they get on with, and they'll just come in and sit and talk. We work and walk alongside them, help them grow in their faith. We have to be their parents. We have to love and care for these kids like they're our own. Because mum and dad, you know, Kenya's like there, mum and dad could be working over here somewhere, thousands of kilometres away, no phone, no internet, and they don't get to talk to them that often. So we have to love and care for these, these kids from kindergarten through to year 12. So it's not just teaching. It's a lot, a lot bigger responsibility than just being a music teacher. Thanks, Mary. We've all heard the Great Commission, and, and we are all kingdom workers. Whether we're here in Launceston, whether in Kajabi, whether serving in the mission fields in Papua New Guinea or Africa, it doesn't matter where we are, we are all mission workers, and God has called us to, to serve him somewhere. I forgot to mention it when I was talking about the, the email. Even before that email, I remember being on duty at school one lunchtime, and I called Heidi. We were... Oh, we were probably just married, so it's 10, almost 11 years ago. And I said, I said, I just think we're going to be working somewhere in God's service, not here. That God had planted a seed that long ago that we would be elsewhere working in his service. No idea where, no idea what. I thought, oh, maybe in the West. Didn't think Africa, not for a moment. Um, Every single disciple of Jesus is called to live for God's glory. And that's what we hope to be doing in Kajabi and what we hope to be showing through our lives to the kids that we get to work with. You make a go, don't you? Right, logistics. So what, what's happened? Um, after all those applications and things, one of the first things they, um, Africa Inland Mission did was send us, here's a list of books you must read. And one was called Friend Raising. It was about building a support network. And so we, we worked through that and it was about building a prayer support network and financial support. And we've been extremely humbled and blessed by the, the generosity of our church family and our own families, um, colleagues from, from work, um, a couple of organisations and people we interact with through the music um, circles we move in have been generous enough to support us. So we have to, as I mentioned earlier, raise funds to, to go and volunteer. Uh, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So we've been, so we've been blessed and um, truly humbled. We had to do a lot of study. This is one of the reasons why Africa Inland Mission said we couldn't go in July last year. When we talked to Wes about what we had to do, he goes, why don't you just sign up and do a two-year diploma of theology at, in you know, the Canadian... Theological Seminary, and then you'd be set. So effectively, two years' worth of theological study would have got us done. And we've said, no thanks, 
we need to work, we need to get there, and we don't have that kind of time. So Africa Inland Mission sent forward uh, their kind of suggestion. We had to do an Old Testament survey, and their suggestion was, I think, how many weeks was it? About 40 weeks of study, um, and each week there are about 15 40-minute lectures to listen to and other readings as well. And I said, thanks, but no thanks. Um, so we put together a, a counter-proposal. We, we um, ran it through WES first, um, and then we sent it off, and thankfully they said yes. We're still going. We've been going for just over for about 12 months now. About 12 months doing it. The first was cultural awareness. We did what's called an equip course, where we had to have mentors who've worked as missionaries. Heidi had um, Reverend John Cruiser, um, of course, who worked in Brazil. And I had a friend of mine, well, a friend of a friend, who I'd met two or three times in Minnesota, who I discovered was a missionary in Kenya for 18 years. So this guy, Gary, provided great insight into what we would see and face. We did that. It was about living and working and sharing the gospel in another culture. We did some missionological studies, so Bible biblical perspectives of mission and theological studies, you know, kind of Old Testament survey, doctrinal studies, still just about finished that one, In, inductive Bible methods, church history, about to start that, life of, life of Christ, spiritual disciplines. And it's been good learning, but hard going, because it's a lot of stuff to cover. So, the finances... Um, all AIM workers are volunteers from the person who works as a mum and dad at RVA to the missionary in the field to the, the airline pilot who's gone over and is flying little one-engine Cessna things to drop missionaries into countries all the way through to the international director. Everybody's a, a, a volunteer. Um, and so they have to raise a support base. Um, as well as that, we have set up costs. So we have um, our fundraising we need to do. We have set up costs, which are close to $25,000 of vaccinations, flights to Africa, um, orientation in Gosford, um, furnishing a house. So we get this empty brick house in Kenya, we have to furnish it. By furnishing, I mean curtains, carpets, oven, a bath, a shower, curtain. It's completely empty. So everybody who goes has to either rent from the school if they're short term or purchase. And the way it works is you know, a family move back home, they sell their house lot. So we bought a house lot um, uh, and we got a, a decent deal. It was about, by the time the exchange rate came through, about five dollars $6,000 um, that we, we had that came out of that roughly $25,000 that we, we've kind of had to put together. Um, we needed medicals. This is, this is another one of God's uh, amazing ways. I was panicking about that. I have a, a heart condition. Um, my heart for a little while was pumping at about 15%. Been on medication for a long time. And I thought that's going to be the kicker. So we had it done. Um, I sent an email. I said, oh, how's it gone? They said, oh, you're fine. Oh, God's answered another, another prayer. We had psych evaluations. I worried, worried about that one as well for Heidi. But she got through. Um, <laughs> We had relocation costs, health insurance, I'm not sure if I said that, travel insurance, um, the inductions and orientation. So when we go to do the orientation in Nairobi, we land in Nairobi, we've got to get transported to wherever that's run. That's an additional cost. We actually have to pay for our accommodation for three and a half weeks there, an additional cost. So everything is you know, raised. On top of that initial funding, we have to raise about $65,000 currently, per annum, it's tied to the American dollar, um, and that's the, the minimum, the minimum living allowance, or they call it, where we pay rent, we pay utilities, gas, electricity, probably have to pay for internet, um, more insurances, superannuation, we'll get you know, the normal 10% super paid on top, um, food, so we've got to pay for our own living and costs. Flights home, administration support, so a small percentage goes to keeping the Australian office working and the international office working, and a thing called work funds. So if we think the school needs a resource they don't have and they can't budget for, 
we get a, a percentage that we can actually take out of our funds to buy that resource for the school. Do you want to talk for a while? Yeah, good. Okay. okay, we're almost at the end of our presentation, but um, just want to share with you another small clip which I think really um, demonstrates um, the motivation we had to, to serve in Kenya, but also that shows the wider uh, need for workers in places like Kenya, and we hope that it um, will also um, plant a seed for you to, uh, to see what it is all about. And really it links into um, to what we see as our mission and what we see as our purpose here on this earth, and it's something we've come back to over and again. Um, I love the, the Westminster Shorter Catechisms, what is the chief end of man or the chief purpose of man, and that is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that's come over and over and over in, in our deliberations, in our thinking, in our study as we've gone through it all. That's what's driving us. We really want to, um, to hang on to that, and I think this little clip will give you a bit of insight into that, if you don't mind, Larry. Welcome to A Road Less Traveled, where men and women captivated by Christ's love brave a journey that begins with a whisper, who will go for us? Maybe you felt that whisper, but what next? There's a lot to consider. The missionary life is a less traveled path for a reason. It's challenging and humbling work, but Jesus' call remains to join him in his mission to seek and save the lost, to step out in obedience into the unknown, into the unexpected. This is an extraordinary call meant for ordinary people like you. Across Africa today, there are nearly a thousand people groups with little or no witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. Countless souls held captive to false religion, fatalism, and fear living in shadows and thirsty for light. But God is at work through his church and those he sends. And AIM has hundreds of opportunities to join this work. From outreach teams to support staff, we are all disciple makers, doing life in the African communities where we serve. We stay long and go deep. We work in teams. We're learners, partners, proclaimers, servants. We love culture and love people. We go to some of the hardest places, boots on the ground, and our sufficiency in Christ. It is an extraordinary call. This life of simple faith and bold conviction, offered and spent for the glory of God in Africa. The Great Commission is an invitation to all this. What if you accept it? What if the years you give will be the best years of your life? Walk with us and see where humble obedience to God's call can take you across a continent of rich cultures and breathtaking beauty and into the lives of a people who long to know of God's love. calling for kingdom work is there and we have been incredibly humbled by the journey that we've been on. We're very excited about the opportunities we have to go and serve in Africa but we're also really um, 
encouraged by the journey that we're on with all of you and the fact that you're sitting here tonight and you're interested in what is happening in kingdom work in Kenya and also the part that we get to play is something that we really want to encourage you as well in your walk because we all have a role to play in the Great Commission. Nobody's exempt from that. Everybody is called um, to that Great Commission to reach out with that gospel truth and we all get to do it in different ways. For us, at this point in our lives, we see that as being called to actually go across to Kenya and to work with the children and with the people that we, um, that we interact with there in Kenya. But for each of us, there's a role to play. And those are some things that we're going to ask of you as well, if we can go to that. Um, yep, there. So ways that you can also support Kingdom Work are incredibly powerful, praying for us, but also praying for the work in Africa. There is so much need in Africa and the prayers of God's people everywhere are powerful. If you would also like to follow what we are doing and follow the journey we're on and come with us on that journey, then please do sign up for our newsletter. Um, many of you have also partnered with us financially and we're deeply grateful for that. That's not supporting us so much as it is supporting kingdom work. And when we see how we can all play that role in God's kingdom, it is, it is very exciting. And there's our blog as well. Um, Steve's pretty um, good at keeping it up to date. So if you would like to follow along with us, then um, you, can, you can follow that work as well. But we'd like to finish just by giving you an opportunity to ask any questions you may have. There's so much information. We live and breathe it every day at the moment. But if there are things that you've got questions about, then um, by all means, we'd, we'd love to try and answer if you have any questions this evening. No questions? Yes, Steve. Um, no, there's, there's a lot more, um, and there's, I guess in the last couple of months, there's been an influx of people wanting to go. Liz, the personal um, manager, has literally run off her feet with inquiries. So mm. um, we probably, in our induction, there were uh, four other people that were there at the same time who are looking at going to one of the other programs. We had um, a, couple, a couple there the ones who are working in Tanzania, they are back what's called home assignment. Um, and there are, there's probably, we don't know the numbers, but probably about 40 people who, who go out. Um, and that includes doctors and nurses that work at the Kajabi Hospital, just at the bottom of the, in the Rift Valley, in Kajabi. Um, it's a Christian hospital, and they're volunteers. Um, but there's a lot who are going there for, for short-term work as well. In the school itself, we were the only Australians there at that point in time, so we fly the flag for Australia. But um, as far as Africa Inland Mission goes, yes, there's, there's probably about 40 workers in the field at present. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, yeah, that sort of leads into that home assignment um, that I, I mentioned a while ago. We'll be there for two years. Um, and there are school holidays. There are, for those people who are teachers, will probably have a heart attack when I say this. They are 13 week terms. Back to the bad old days. Which is <laughs> going to kill me. Um, so, 13 week terms, a month off. So, you get then, you do a term, a month of wrapping up, marking in, then two weeks off, then a mark of, a week of planning um, and professional development, then back and so you get like two weeks off. And during those two weeks, they encourage you to go out into the field to visit the students and their parents in their village, where they work and live, to make that connection with the missionaries so that they know that you're there for their kids. So it's two years of teach, visit, plan, mark, catch a breath, and it just happens. And I think the Christmas break or the main breaks might be six weeks, um, but after the two years, Everybody, after two years, everyone must go back to their sending region, so back to Australia for us, and we have what's called home assignment, where you'd go to churches and, and talk, talk to people, a bit like what we're doing tonight about Africa in Mission and what we're doing there, have debrief sessions with their psychologists, um, just helping us reintegrate back into Western society and some time just to rest. It's, uh, it's intense being a teacher, and we think it's going to be, from what we understand, 
a little more intense, working in a, another culture with what's known as third culture kids. They have their culture they came from, the culture their parents work in, and then the culture of Kenya and the school they're in. So we'll have you know, two cultures, but coming back and decompressing and resting um, and getting ready for the next thing that God calls us for. And basically the holidays that they have are designed in such a way that because the children live on campus in the boarding school, um, gives them that opportunity to have a chunk of time with their families. So they'll either go out to their families in the field if it's safe to do so, or if not, then there's often opportunities their parents can come to visit them and spend time with them in a safe location if they're in one of the creative access areas. So that's just an opportunity for the children to connect with their parents, which it's just hard to imagine little kids, you know, being in a boarding school, but that's the sacrifices that, um, that the parents are making for their work in, in Kenya as well. Yeah. Gives us good motivation to want to be there and to want to love and support as well when you sort of think of it like that. So, for sure. yeah. Anyone else? No, there's no more questions. Well, thank you for coming. Um, and our last, I did tell a lie earlier. I will speak a little bit more Swahili. Asante sana na baraka. Thank you very much and blessings. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen Heidi, for the presentation. Um, certainly a, an eye-opener for where you're going, and um, we certainly thank God that he has uh, shown you this path, and we uh, certainly wish you and that God will certainly bless you and uh, give you the strength with the uh, important work of um, spreading the gospel around, uh, around these countries, and uh, certainly commend you both on, uh, on, on the path you have taken. We'll, uh, Pray also that uh, God will, will bless you in this. So I'll just close this meeting then in, in prayer. And um, if you do have any further questions, I suppose Heidi and Steve will still be around here to, um, to answer them for you. I'll just uh, close in prayer. Almighty God and Father, you are our maker. We praise you for giving us life and sustaining us every day. You give us all we need for body and soul. Make us diligent workers, wise stewards and cheerful givers. Keep us from wasting your gifts on empty and selfish pursuits. Give us a heart of wisdom. We thank you, Father, that you have guided Steve and Heidi to use their gifts and talents in the service of your name. We pray that you will bless their work that they will, that they will take up soon in Kenya. Guide them so they may boldly testify your name and of a saviour who was conceived, born and died for us. We pray, Father, that you may give us all the courage to speak out in a selfish world that has largely forgotten you and ignores your creative work. Help us in every situation to stand fast in perspective that we are your children, bought with Christ's blood and sealed with, your, with his spirit. May that identity give us confidence today and every day to walk before your holy face, to encourage each other, and especially in, to encourage and support Stephen Heidi as they leave Tasmania. Help us now to rest in the knowledge that you hear us and care for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>